Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, please let me start uh, the next panel, which will be about the civil society in the Middle East. My name is Irena Kalhousova, and I will moderate uh, this panel. Uh, I work as an analyst at the Prague Security Studies Institute, and my focus is ac actually the Middle East. So this is a really great uh, honor and opportunity for me to be in this panel with uh, so many interesting people with, uh, from, from um, different countries with such a different background. So I hope we will have a nice discussion. Um, the topic of the civil society in the Middle East is can't be more topical, I would say, because two and a half years after the revolutions, uprising, spring, winter, call it however you want, uh, the civil society, I would say, was the biggest surprise of this process. And suddenly, we saw that there are forces which were not uh, visible before that, that there are people, organizations, movements, uh, which uh, want some change and actually they know what they want. Uh, maybe they, they don't know exactly how to reach it, but uh, that's uh, actually the topic for, for this afternoon. To what extent the civil society is effective, uh, to what extent it didn't uh, lose its, uh, its uh, energy. Uh, so we will we will discuss all these uh, all these uh, issues uh, today. Um, maybe, of course, uh, we will also discuss the objectives of the civil society today in the Middle East. Because, of course, uh, maybe some of them already lost hope. Maybe uh, some of them are too pessimistic, seeing what's uh, what's uh, the the result of this. Uh, of this process which started two and a half years ago. Uh, I know that you have all the programs, so I don't want to read the bios of our speakers, but uh, still, please let me shortly introduce the, all our speakers uh, so you know actually what their background is and where are they from. I will, because we have only men in this panel, I'm sorry that it's so generally uh, unbalanced, but uh, but I hope uh, it won't be any problem for Ahmed. Uh, so I will start uh, introducing him. Ahmed Maher is from Egypt. He is a blogger and activist, and in his young age, he already was a Nobel Peace Prize nominee, and he was a very prominent figure uh, of uh, the revolution in 2011. He is the founder of the April 6 Youth Movement. And he himself uh, went through an interesting process because uh, in the beginning of this, he supported uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, after what happened in Egypt, he, uh, I think, very much changed his opinion. So it's also interesting to see this personal, uh, personal development. Then we have Clara Bednářová, uh, who works for uh, the organization People in Need, Člověk v tísni. And she is involved in, e uh, in Egypt and in Libya in various projects. And she's traveling to the region very often. She just came back from Libya, I, I believe, a week ago. So she has really a first-hand uh, experience. Uh, next on my right is um, uh, Nada Daif. She's chairwoman for, from Bahrain. And uh, she's chairman of Bahrain Rehabilitation and Anti-Violence Organization. And she, unfortunately, has personal experience with being prosecuted in Bahrain. So it will be also very interesting to, to hear your experience and your feelings. Last but not least, we have a speaker from, uh, from Libya, uh, Fatma Hawass. She is a lawyer. She works for the National Council of Libya and uh, also works for the Department of Documentation of the National Council. And she has really, really first-hand experience with implementing certain things, uh, like you know, trying to, to install a rule of law in, in Libya. Uh, she, will, she will has a, a translator, so she speaks in, in Arabic. And it will be also very interesting to hear actually what's happening in Libya, because this seems to be one of the key countries and we don't speak a lot about Libya, which probably is uh, actually a, a big, big problem, being so much focused on what's going on now in Egypt or, or Syria. So we will have also the Libyan point of view. So that's uh, all, all for the beginning. There will be time for questions and comments. So please, uh, you know, prepare the questions if you, if you have any. And for the beginning, I would like to ask uh, 
three speakers from the region. If you can tell us a little bit uh, more about the civil society in your specific countries, because of course not everybody here is an expert on the civil society. So in which stage it is, uh, what, so what are the major issues, uh, uh, and simply how, how you see it. And uh, for Clara, I will have a little bit different question. Uh, how you see the civil society in the countries which you, which you visit, or maybe general in the Middle East, how do you see it compared to the civil society here in, in the Czech Republic or in, in, in Europe? Um, to, to what, what are the similarities, what are the differences? Uh, so if you can, if you can uh, do this for us. So that's the first question, and uh, I will ask Nada to start. Thank you. Um, well, in fact, the, uh, uh, the movement in my country, Bahrain, uh, just didn't uh, come along with the Arab Spring two, two and a half years ago, three years ago. It actually started a century ago, since the 1920s, and we've been calling every 10 years, every decade, there's an uprising, and then we get oppressed, and it uh, keeps on, on, and on, and on. Um, but still, the role of civil society uh, I can almost say almost nil. Uh, it started and uh, it started rising up with the recent Arab hype that went throughout uh, the Middle East. Uh, before um, the role was minimal, it, it wasn't allowed to play that role. People are meant uh, to be under the direct control of the government. Of course, internationally, uh, it's only something related, perhaps some of you, this is the first time you will hear this term. It's called the Gongos. It's like something that came from the Gulf region, which is the governmental, non-governmental NGOs. Like these, they make up something like a made up civil society. And that goes to the, they represent these people to the international community and to the United Nations and extra, extra, extra. The people, um, people from, from the civil society, exactly, they've been a surprise to the international community as well to us. We have lots of energies that's coming up, standing up, and they have this appetite and hunger to learn and help and improve. Thank you for so far very general answer and I will ask you then more specific questions. Uh, Ahmed. Thank you Irina for this question. Uh, situation of uh, civil society in Egypt, uh, maybe now it's better, but if we going back to before the revolution, it's uh, totally under controlled by the government and we have very bad law for NGO, organizing NGOs, uh, totally controlled by the government. They can cancel any activities, they control the finance, they can refuse anything, they can refuse any activities from any NGO. So it's totally controlled and before the revolution it's uh, the majority of NGOs in Egypt is related to the government. It's just taking uh, orders from the government. And any NGOs working in the poor neighborhoods uh, just uh, for services, social services, it's allowed. But about human rights, about uh, freedom, about uh, uh, supporting uh, prisoners or something like that, so it's uh, not allowed. And that's make many lawyers and many human rights defenders uh, make uh, companies or uh, offices for uh, lawyers to work as NGOs, but also it's supervised or uh, surrounded by the police sometimes, and if the police or the government feel that any dangerous or anyone make a noise from NGOs so they can uh, close this, uh, this uh, NGO or this uh, institution. That was before January, 20, 25th of January. Uh, a few persons, a few NGOs working hard and don't afraid from police, don't afraid from the government, and they try to support democracy and freedom and equality and 
uh, when someone arrested, when I arrested, I can find lawyers, not too much, but persons known, they are known in Egypt. Uh, after the revolution, uh, from February until August or the end of 2011, it's, uh, it was the opening of civil society in Egypt. Many NGOs registered it very easy at that time. But also when the military regime in the 2011 felt dangerous or noise from uh, civil society, they started to close and prevent again. And this very famous case in Egypt talking about foreign funding and the spies, and they canceled or uh, they uh, closed many offices for uh, American and European NGOs in Egypt. Now it's the same also. The NGOs in Egypt now, it's again the government or the new regime try to control, try to cause the troubles, and we wait uh, the next parliament or the next uh, law of NGOs to, to decide if it's, if it's good or not. But the, the regimes in Egypt before the revolution and now don't like NGOs. So that's a problem. Thank you very much. Please. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم في البداية في ليبيا مصطلح مؤسسة المجتمع المدني مصطلح جديد غير موجود لكن بفضل التوراة أو بفضل الربيع العربي تم انتقال ليبيا من الحكم الدكتاتوري إلى التحول الديمقراطي في الماضي كانت مؤسسة المجتمع المدني ليس لها وجود كانت توجد مؤسسة أو اثنان تابعة لمعمر القذافي أو تابعة لأبنائه Good afternoon, first of all. Uh, I would say that uh, in Libya, in the beginning, uh, the, uh, the name of civil society uh, did not belong in the term, uh, in terminology of uh, Arabic uh, in Libya at all. Uh, they could be one or two societies that could be called the civil societies, but they were belonging to Gaddafi or uh, to his sons, one or two of these societies. حاليا بعد الثورة اتجه يعني تكونت العديد من مؤسسات المجتمع المدني بمختلف أنواعها سواء كانت حقوقية أو شبابية رغم عدم وجود قانون ينظمها لكن كان لها يعني دخلت بقوة بعدد كبير كان لها أداء واضح كانت تقدم مشاريع لدولة مشاريع مشروع قوانين للدولة في البعض منها لديها قوة والبعض منها ضعيفة يعني يختلف في أنحاء مناطق ليبيا توجد يعني مناطق توجد بها عدد كبير من مؤسسات المجتمع المدني ومناطق لا توجد بها أي مؤسسة مجتمع مدني. Uh, nowadays, we have uh, a lot of uh, civil societies. Uh, they are of legal uh, intention. They are uh, some of the civic uh, aims. Uh, they are some of them are working really good. Uh, some of them are in areas which uh, uh, can't work so uh, in such an effective way. Uh, some of them uh, work with such a number of uh, people. Uh, well, so I would say that there are a lot of them uh, now in the in the field of uh, Libya. بشكل عام في الوقت الحالي المؤسسات بمختلف أنواعها لها كامل الحرية بتحقيق أهدافها أو المبنية على المؤسسة وكذلك بشكل عام المؤسسات في المجتمع المدني في ليبيا. لا تزال يعني ضعيفة بمعنى أن جيدة بعض الشيء وهذا يرجع إلى عدم وعي مؤسسات المجتمع المدني بدورها في المرحلة أو إلى عدم تركيز نشاطاتها وبرامجها وفق أهدافها وكذلك كذلك لقلة الدعم اللوجستي والمادي. Now, uh, some of them are working very well, and I think uh, that's uh, because uh, they have, uh, um, they 
uh, they have specified their aims and uh, their ways, uh, their projects. Uh, some of them are really weak, uh, that uh, comes to uh, the weakness of uh, the logistics uh, of uh, some means, uh, and uh, so they're, uh, they're producing uh, means are very, eff uh, very less effective. مؤسسات المجتمع المدني كذلك يعني يمكن فهم العلاقة بين مؤسسات المجتمع المدني والديمقراطية في عدة اعتبارات منها أن مؤسسات المجتمع المدني تتوسط العلاقة بين المجتمع والدولة وتعتبر حاليا كورقة ضاغطة على الحكومة لتنفيذ القرار وتعتبر, وتعتبر كذلك كحلقة وصل مؤسسية uh, the way we understand what the civil society is is uh, that uh, we think it's a kind of uh, uh, mean of pressure on the government uh, to fulfill uh, the needs of uh, uh, of uh, the people. Uh, so uh, this is the relation between the government and the civil society, or the, between the government and the people in uh, in the country. أنا أعتقد أن كل هذه الأسباب طبيعية وذلك لحداثة مصطلح مؤسسة المجتمع المدني في ليبيا وليبيا متمثلة في المجتمع المدني حاليا تحتاج للدعم في جميع الجوانب وعلى رأسها نشر ثقافة حقوق الإنسان والإصلاح القانوني وكذلك التنمية البشرية <تصفيق> I think there is a need of uh, supporting uh, the uh, non-governmental uh, and civic society. Uh, but the the uh, support uh, should go into uh, the uh, the publication of the uh, rights, the human rights, and uh, and uh, to the reforms, uh, the legal reforms, and uh, okay. Thank you very much, Clara. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for having me in the panel, Hasti, <laughs> um, uh, speaking about the, the region. Um, the question of the similarities and differences with, uh, with the Czech civil society is actually a very um, important one because a lot of the work of European NGOs, and uh, including our NGO, is uh, trying to help and trying to connect um, uh, organizations from Europe working on similar topics to the ones in the, in the region. And uh, I have to say that the experience is often very relevant. I mean, it's, it's for, for um, our guests to say, but, um, and, um, and important. So in a way already I'm saying there are similarities. Um, um, there are great similarities. The first one I think I would start with is the presence of civil society in, in, in the Czech Republic or in, in uh, Central and Eastern Europe and uh, or the lack of the presence uh, and uh, the same goes for, for Libya as has already been uh, mentioned. Um, in, in Egypt, I think uh, Ahmed already touched on it, uh, even though the civil society or Egypt is known to have a very developed civil society, we are really talking about a specific, uh, specific kind which goes more into charities and uh, any organizations which were trying to take the, the, the go beyond that role had, had issues with even existing and, and were, were persecuted. Um, in the Czech Republic, we, we also went through the, 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 the formation phase in the beginning of the 90s. And uh, um, so I think this is, this is an important similarity and that we can draw a lot from uh, in, in, in working, working in the region. And we try to do so. Um, so um, this is, I think, the, the most important. Um, I don't know about the differences, but I would, uh, I would say rather specifics of, um, of um, civil society in the, in the Arab region. Um, I think one, I could, I could touch on a lot of things, including the, the, the legal aspects, and, and Ahmed already mentioned part of it, the NGO law. I mean, in the Czech Republic, uh, civil society organizations basically have to inform uh, the, the authorities here about their existence and, of course, comply with the law. But um, the, the level of, uh, of control is, is, is very, it's, it's incomparable to what we, are, what we are seeing in Egypt. 
In Libya, this is still in the formation phase, and uh, um, let's say that the freedom there is much bigger for the moment. Um, but I will not. The, the application of, of some of the, um, the the projects of civil society organizations in Libya are facing other challenges, such as security, and I think this will be covered further in in in, in our discussion. Um, what uh, what I wanted to raise, though, is the the specific kind. Uh, I mean. Uh, of uh, role that civil society is playing in, 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 in the Arab region, uh, it's almost as a stepping stone towards politics. I mean, um, after the revolutions, a lot of people somehow wanted to play, uh, uh, to, to play a part in the, in, in the democratic transformation, which turned out not to be so much of a transformation in some countries. Um, without actually entering the political the political sphere, um, and uh, because it is a new it is a new field, and uh, we can talk about the reasons why. But um, the I think this is the this is really uh, the, the civil society there is really the start of um, people finding uh, finding out how to um, how to listen to the needs of others and implementing them and in a way this is the this is the micro micro uh, uh, political role and uh, which hopefully will 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 move forward but this is something quite specific um, whereas in in the Czech Republic or in the European countries there seems to be quite a div division of roles here we have civil society here we have political parties in in Egypt and in Libya, um, many people are still hesitant to enter the political uh, the, the political game as as such, and um, and the divi dividing lines are very uh, very blurred. And uh, I think this is a challenge at the same time, uh, um, uh, uh, something to uh, help us understand uh, also the nature of the democratic transformation in in these countries. So. Thank you very much. We will definitely go back to this topic to what extent the civil society is, is able to generate new, new leaders, new political leaders. But before we, we, we will uh, get there, I, I have another question um, concerning the civil society, which started as sort of a political, non-ideological, youth-driven activist movement under the banner Dignity, Bread and Freedom. Uh, so my question is if this still offer viable solution for the countries or to what, uh, what are actually the main goals of the civil societies? I know that there are many, it's, it's, it's maybe wrong to talk about one. Uh, in, in your specific country, uh, to what really, what are the main, main, uh, main demands? And I know that there was not an Arab Spring in Bahrain, but there still is uh, some, uh, some kind of beginning of the civil society movement. So what are your political, uh, political demands? or demands, not necessarily political. Uh, so I don't know if we will go in the same order and then I will shift it somehow. So please, Nada, please start. <laughs> okay, in Bahrain in particular, uh, the thin line between uh, the work of civil society and politics is uh, somehow invisible. I totally support the separation of the both lines, the political line and the, the civil line. Uh, but it's understandable that this kind of mix that happens at, um, at this stage, because uh, the, the world is looking and there are very few activists, very few people who are willing uh, to step forward and to make that change within this society. Um, that's why the burden on those few number of people uh, is huge to deliver the message, uh, whether it's a human rights message, political message, or um, other services within the community. Uh, however, uh, specifically, um, now, the whole picture, we can sum it up in the, um, in the political demands or the, the, the demands that pe pe people are demanding their rights and freedom and democracy and share in power, uh, end of corruption, transparency, uh, rule of law. These are the general uh, lines, but still, we have lots of issues underneath that needs to look, we need to look at and we need to pay attention to, which are, which are the, the women's issues, uh, the children, uh, victims of torture, um, 
but we're not getting that enough of support, especially when it comes to the Gulf, uh, when it, whenever it comes to the Gulf region. Uh, the, the, the whole international community turns a blind eye, thinking that uh, these NGOs in that part of the world are rich enough to stand, or no need, because they are silent, silenced by our regimes. Um, again, uh, what's happening uh, in the Gulf is, is nothing like it. Not, you can't compare it to the rest, uh, to, to, to Libya, to Egypt, because what we see is all the projects are designed uh, to serve uh, the other Middle East and exclude the Gulf in particular. Um, I want to talk about the, the, the huge uh, definition about civil society. It's not only NGOs. From my perspective, I consider in, uh, civil society is including political parties, it's including uh, trade unions, it's including um, student unions, and also NGOs. That is civil society. So when I want to improve or make the civil society is more strong, so I want to make the NGOs strong and trade unions and syndicates and student unions and political parties. This make the process, that's the, this component is leading the process and this component, if, if we make these uh, parties and NGOs is more strong, that will be helpful for the community. Uh, so, um, Civil societies have very important role with NGOs and political parties and unions have very important role to, to build a strong country. And when we follow what happened in, in, in Europe after the revolution, the, the civil society played very important role to build uh, a good process, democratic process, and make a training to political parties and supervising, supervising elections and building country. Maybe that is a problem in Egypt because till now we haven't real and serious civil society. We haven't real unions or free unions in Egypt. We haven't real or free student unions in Egypt. Till now we haven't strong and serious, just a few uh, NGOs, but we haven't totally NGOs. Uh, so that's till now. Uh, can't help to build a healthy atmosphere, political atmosphere, or helping in the process and political process in, in Egypt. So we need to improve civil society in Egypt, including NGOs and uh, unions. Uh, also, and that is the, the, the reason make any government or authority targeting civil society. Uh, that's happened in Mubarak time, in the military time, 2011, also in Morsi time. Morsi, when Morsi was a president, he targeted civil society and he follow and make many troubles to civil society. And when he start to talk with civil society, he just brought or meet the uh, NGOs working in the uh, social services or helping poor peoples. He ignored the NGOs working in democracy and training and uh, supporting human rights or women rights or minority rights. So that is a problem. And also, I want to, to comment about something about uh, the NGOs working in uh, religious services or religious NGOs. Uh, in Egypt, it's allowed. Before the revolution, it's allowed to, it's not strange to find NGO working to build mosques, to build, build hospital, to, to helping poor people. These NGOs, these Islamic NGOs, uh, make a, a Nur party, for example, after the revolution. So it's very important to to help in that or to have interference, interference in the political life. So many NGOs made a political party and they take 20% in the elections after the revolution. So the role of civil society is very important and uh, we need to, to search how to make, make it more strong and how to uh, decrease the obstacles uh, put it by the government and the authority. Uh, 
متطلبات المجتمع المدني في ليبيا يمكن ان تكون يعني مؤسسات المجتمع المدني في طريق الديمقراطيه ولديها الكثير من المتطلبات على على راسها او على اولها هي اعطائها كامل الحريه في تحقيق اهدافها او في تقصي الحقائق What are the needs of the civil society in Libya? This is her freedom, freedom to talk, freedom to to produce their activities in in every way, and this is from the basic things. يعني المؤسسات المجتمع المدني مختلفة في منها. مؤسسات اتجاه ديني مؤسسات حقوقية مؤسسات شبابية فنحن مثلا المجلس الوطني للحريات العامة حقوق الإنسان يعني نظام العمل لدينا قريب إلى مؤسسات المجتمع المدني نحن نرصد ونتقصى الحقائق في انتهاكات حقوق الإنسان ولدينا كذلك تعاون مع مؤسسات أخرى أو مد أو دعمها أو مد يد العون لها في طريقة عملها. There are many civil societies or among the civil societies in Libya there are many organizations that uh, are legal, some for some working with the uh, young people, uh, some are Islamic too. And uh, I think uh, from uh, my point of view, we are uh, trying to uh, observe whether they are, uh, whether the, uh, the way of uh, uh, behaving in the, in the country is uh, totally legal, it's uh, uh, according to the uh, uh, to the human rights, or are there any uh, things that uh, are really uh, um, bad until now, which we were we used uh, to in the past? البعض منها يعني بعض من المؤسسات تحمي المواطن من تعسف الدولة وتحمي كذلك الدولة من أعمال العنف السياسي التي قد تلجأ إليه بعض القوى والجماعات. عندما تعجز عن الدولة عن توصيل مطالبها عبر قنواتها الرسمية. There are society, there are organizations that are trying to help the civilists against the the government, and from the other side, they are observing whether the government is always dealing with the with the people in a good way, if they are acting brutally against against them or something like that. شيء أخير من أهم متطلباتها هي أفسح كامل الحرية لها ودعمها سواء كان دعم لوجستي أو مادي. And the main role of them is to give them the opportunity of having the full logistics and freedom for their work. I would like to ask you, Clara, if you can tell us to what extent you, as an informed outsider, to what extent do you think that uh, the demands of the civil society are clear to, to us? You know, do you really understand what they need in Egypt and Libya, or you see that you know it's very difficult to understand it? There are many different opinions. Uh, what should be done? What what they really need? Mm. I think that there's an element of understanding and wanting to understand. I think. Asking questions is generally a problem for us as international community and uh, the civil society or our partners in the in the countries themselves. Um, for us, because we we have certain models that, that that we work with and we have to implement, and and working in the project logic is, uh, the, to to say the least, sometimes a challenge. To, to link to the actual needs of the, uh, the, the organizations, um, but we try. Um, from the side of, uh, from the, side of uh, the, the civil society, and, and, I'm usually, and I'm mostly speaking for about, Lig about Egypt and Libya, where I, where I have the experience, um, it is not easy. It is not easy to always find out what is needed. 
Um, as I said, in Egypt, the, there is an impression we've had, uh, we've had a civil society for a long time. There are certain models of work, there are certain activities that are already running. Uh, and let's say the dialogue and is not as as open, and uh, uh, it it is hard to even be asked for something specific, whether it's uh, uh, in the form of uh, type of training or um, even trying to find out more about the um, certain policy reforms and which which areas to look at, um, and the. I think the, a very important role for us uh, who, who, who work in these countries and, and, and try to help is to simply lead a, a, an ongoing dialogue with, with, with the people and um, uh, to, to discuss and to ask the questions and uh, uh, because we don't always, uh, we don't always hear them, but uh, the, the need is there, it's just very hard to specify it. That's, that's what I meant, not... Uh, the other way around, but uh, in, in in Libya, of course, this is a completely we're, we're talking is a completely new term, as as, as Fatma mentioned, um, and you know we came with uh, with the idea, okay, so the all these people who who helped during the revolution, whether by giving food to the to the to the fighters on the front or taking care of the the the, the families that were left behind, uh, we we call this in our part of the world we call this civil society. And we are now going to help civil society. And I feel that we uh, we did not uh, we did not concentrate. We were so happy with the fact that there is a, a, a movement from the people independently doing things. We were so and we were trying to help with it that uh, that we focused less on the specific needs. And and so I I, I think there's maybe almost a misunderstanding of what. Um, the civil society can want from us what kind of support uh, they, they, they can ask and what we are actually offering. And uh, I think we should focus more on, basically, I just repeat myself, uh, on, on, talking, on talking about uh, how we can, we can help each other. And uh, um, uh, obviously, the, sometimes we... Uh, we see Libya, for example, and I take th this example because it's, uh, it's uh, I think, maybe also relevant to Bahrain, that the money is there, the funding is present. Uh, why should the organizations be having issues with, with the funding um, when, in fact, uh, a, a lot of people have spent working as volunteers for, for, for more than a year, spending money from their pockets to... Uh, to, to have a civil society and um, obviously this cannot go on forever and uh, so I think we should also uh, again listen a little bit more and look more into the into the situation because the needs needs uh, are there and uh, we don't always see it firsthand because we have preconceptions so yeah actually you touch already my, my next question that in the aftermath of the revolution the people reacted on the disappearance of the state apparatus by organizing this society. And I would like to ask you if this spirit of collective action, which is so necessary for the building of the civil society, if it's still there, or to what extent the people are already tired and hopeless seeing what's, what's happening in, in both in Egypt and, and in Libya and in Bahrain, to what extent people say, well, you know, there's no, no reason for us to work as volunteers to be active in the civil society because it actually doesn't, uh, doesn't bring any positive results for us. So let's change the order, as I promised, and uh, I, I'll, I'll ask uh, Fatma to start, if, if it's okay. أنا على ما أعتقد أنها روح المواطنين أيام بداية الثورة أنا ما أعتقد أنها خفت قليلا أو ضعفت قليلا عن بداية الثورة كان النشاط أكثر كان لكن لا نقول ضعف عام حاليا يعني من خلال مؤسسات المجتمع المدني أو من خلال من خلال مؤسسات المجتمع المدني نفسها يعني لا زالت لديها تلك الروح حاليا يعني توجد 
عديد مؤسسات المجتمع المدني تطور إنشاء لديها روح إيجابية نحو التورة لديها رغبة في التحول الديمقراطي وذلك من خلال مشاركة الحكومة في تقديم مشاريع قوانين لتطوير ليبيا أو الاتجاه نحو التحول الديمقراطي I think the spirit uh, of the citizens, uh, of course, it weakened from, from the beginning of the revolution, but uh, I think there is a still a lot of uh, uh, effectivity and power and uh, looking forward of uh, the organization of, uh, of uh, the civil societies to, uh, to aim to something, to project something, and this is, of course, uh, in, uh, in sight of uh, bringing Libya to better days. كذلك الروح موجودة كذلك في يعني مؤسسة المجتمع المدني عن طريق أن تعمل كورقة ضغط على الحكومة لإنشاء قانون للمصالحة الوطنية كذلك إنشاء لقانون للعدالة الانتقالية أنا أعتبر هذا روح وطنية قوية. تواكب الروح التي يعني التي وجدناها أيام بداية الثورة. And I think the organizations are trying to work hardly to uh, uh, be um, okay with the past, what what happened to Libya, and uh, to go forward in uh, uh, in the future, and uh, of course to uh, make uh, Libya in the democratic way of uh, government. How do you see it? You still see the same energy as you know two years ago, and you see that basically it's changing. I, I don't think the energy as such has disappeared. I think it's been more channeled. Um, I mean, obviously, we, we're not uh, we're not talking about an aftermath of a, of the resignation of Mubarak, where you went into the streets and you you entered cafes and people were discussing and printing T-shirts and thinking what what can we do and and really covering all sorts of topics and ways and uh, and the the same the same in 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 Libya. Uh, where people were continuing with a lot of charity work uh, and uh, really everybody was involved. Uh, half a year later you would, uh, you would meet uh, the same people going back to their, to their normal lives and um, pretty much not the energy not disappearing but just uh, simply that, that urgency was not, uh, was not so present with everyone anymore. And I think this is actually the key, the urgency, which is what makes uh, a civil society function well, is the, is the need to have it in the first place, not as a concept we, we, we implement. Um, and, um, but uh, by channeling, I mean that, uh, uh, especially in Libya, we've seen a lot of, uh, um, uh, a lot more specialization in, in the work of NGOs, and, and Fatma has, has mentioned this. Um, and uh, I want to raise especially one, one group, which is uh, um, uh, human rights activists who are, um, who are in fact investing a lot more, and I think if, if not more, uh, by, by often risking their lives in, 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 in fighting for even women's rights in, in certain parts of, of, of Libya, and even to do with development, because uh, uh, the strong role of civil society is not welcomed by everyone. Um, so I cannot say that um, I would maybe uh, disagree that the, the spirit is disappearing in, 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 in Libya, but uh, it's, it's being channeled and uh, it's, um, I think now we can really start the, 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 the support process where we have partners to talk to and people who are able to define uh, the, their goals and uh, um, in the, so this is um, this is how I would put it. Um, yes, as, as um, Lara mentioned, that after the revolution, uh, the few months after the revolution, you can see all Egyptian want to do something. Volunteers to painting, to uh, teaching, to do anything for Egypt, to build Egypt. So the hope at that time in 2011 after Mubarak, so the hope to build, to new, to, to do everything. Uh, this curve was ultimate 
point in 2011 and then uh, down again after the, the, the attacking of the SCAF uh, at the middle of uh, 2011. So, uh, because there is a lot of bad propaganda against uh, civil society and the NGOs at that time, that foreign funding and the spies and these rumors make many persons afraid from uh, joining uh, civil society or NGOs again at that time. But the inspiration or the, the hope again during, uh, after Morsi won the election in 2012, uh, all the people said, okay, we will work again, we will help, we will help to make a training, to teaching, to painting, to help poor people again. That was a few months after Morsi won the elections. And also for April 6, we are not an NGO and we are not a political party. We are like a pressure group, something between political parties and NGOs. So we said, okay, we will stop criticism. We will help Morsi and help Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood to build Egypt. And we start to make many campaigns to build and to clean roads and to uh, teaching literate people and talk about uh, democracy and uh, helping other people at that time. But also the hope disappeared after uh, what happened from Morsi and from Muslim Brotherhood. So the curve is down again. Now in Egypt, there is nothing. <laughs> now in Egypt, it's vague. Uh, there is no rule of NGOs. There is no rule of political parties. There is no rule of civil society. The people are afraid from anything. There's a, a lot of uh, hate in the community now. So it's a very bad situation now for civil society and political parties and movements also. It's a freeze time. We as a sex movement and also many political parties do nothing. We wait what after the constitution, maybe in the election, we will wake up again in the elections. Uh, political parties and movement and, and NGOs and civil society work again in the elections uh, or in the constitution, but now it's, uh, it's not a stable now. But the civil society, I think, the very important tool to civil society now in Egypt to make many workshops and many meetings and many conferences talk about tolerance, forgiveness, uh, nonviolence, uh, reconciliation, these principles, we need these principles now in Egypt because it's very dangerous. If, the, if this polarization or hate continue in Egypt, it will be very dangerous. So it's uh, the rule now of civil society, brave persons in civil society to talk again about tolerance and live together and reconciliation. Thank you. In the Gulf specifically, uh, Bahrain, uh, despite the risks, uh, we see the civil society and the parliamentarians are really active. But of course, it's a long way and it's a long time. And during that path, people fall off and trip sometimes. And it goes back to multiple factors. There's always the fear of persecution. There's always um, the reprisals against the human rights defenders. There's uh, also the government is not uh, uh, making it no secret or hiding that they're trying to bribe some of the activists and bringing it to their sides as if you, what you're doing is no go and you're not going anywhere. Um, also, um, uh, the, the, the campaigns that it's against the, the activists, the human rights defenders, especially women, which is the defamation, defamation um, that is putting off a lot of people. Add to it on top of that, again, as I mentioned before, the, la the, the, the projects that uh, assigned to our part of the region is very, very rare. Uh, the disappointment from the international community where we think it's the role of the bigger countries to take care of the smaller ones and to help them through that transition. But that is not the situation. That's not what we're facing. The, the, there's no understanding of the, ne the needs of um, the civil society in my region um, as well as uh, the necessary support and solidarity. I, I just wanted to add, um, when we talk about waves and uh, the changing spirit in the, of, of the civil society, the countries themselves, this also happens on the level of um, our countries. 
and uh, even even international uh, civil society organizations. Um, and the reason why that happens is because of the, the, the usually the funding opportunities. I mean, it's a practical aspect. You know, not every organization, not every entity is able to seek uh, uh, to to go and um, help where it is needed at the particular moment from from independent sources. It's uh, or independent. I mean, uh, that there is a there is an element of prioritization in in politics in allocating in allocating funds and this is a this is a fact um, that we do not have to um, we, we we don't um, uh, need to need to cover and uh, the same goes for uh, governments within the countries I think uh, um, in what in opening up space to civil society and closing it up again and uh, I think uh, Libya will be an interesting example where the government basically came from civil society and is still functioning a lot with it. But uh, how this will how this will develop will also shape the way whether um, activists, whether individual uh, uh, activists or organizations are able to able to do the work and how they will continue in the future. Um, so I think there's few levels that we can focus on. There. Maybe I will have, uh, I don't know uh, if this is a question for everybody, but definitely for, uh, for Ahmed and Nada. To what extent uh, you see uh, the political, new political leaders coming from the civil society? And uh, because after the revolution or revolutions, uh, this was quite expected that these uh, huge demonstrations will actually generate new leaders. And it maybe happened in Libya, but it didn't happen in Egypt so much. Uh, and in Bahrain, it's more complicated because the Arab Spring didn't happen there. But still, uh, and and do you think that there is still space uh, to you know to generate these leaders, or that there is not because the political situation has changed, and simply uh, you you won't even get this chance. But uh, I would like to ask you more, m not so much about the political situation, but you know the situation of the civil society. Did you already change your mind? Because I remember that that was actually the goal. We don't have a leader. You know, we are a group of you know many opinions, and we don't want to generate a leader. So, don't you think that this was maybe a mistake? Uh, yes, it's a, it's a problem that we haven't uh, political leaders or political organization in Egypt after the revolution. All the political parties after the revolution disappeared, or not all, but majority of them disappeared after the revolution. And now if you want to find the alternative, okay, now Muslim Brotherhood disappeared, and there are the second wave of revolution, uh, Sebdaou Morsi, who is the alternative now? You. It's uh, not easy to find which party or coalition can lead Egypt in the future. It's not easy to, to find someone or, or leader or political party or party have leaders. So maybe it's a, it's a mistake of civil society before the revolution and after the revolution. Maybe it's not a mistake, it's a mistake of the government because they controlled and they make obstacles to civil society in Egypt before the revolution and after the revolution. Yes, I, I believe that civil society will produce leaders, political leaders in, in, in uh, uh, youth movements or uh, political parties. And the four or five or six months in the beginning, in 2011, it's not enough to make leaders and to teaching uh, the people how to organize political parties, how to make a campaign in the elections. We didn't uh, learn this information. And there is not enough time at that, at that time between February and August, I think, because the campaign and propaganda against uh, NGOs was in August 2011. So now any foreign NGOs, they are afraid from working in Egypt anymore. They said, no, 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 we don't work in Egypt because security can attack our office. Uh, they, can, they, uh, they say we are spies, so we don't work in, in Egypt again. That's a big problem. So, yes, I'm optimistic. <laughs> uh, after that, we will try again. I'm not involved in 
NGOs or civil society. I am uh, yeah, working in movements as opposition, as a pressure group, revolutionary movements, advocate and make a pressure to have the revolution demands. Yes, we have inter intersection with civil society and we have intersection with the political parties. So we will encourage that and we will help and uh, we will involve in other campaigns to encourage that and make a training uh, to political leaders and the movements and political parties. And we hope and we will wait. And uh, I think we will success and in the future. Come. Yeah. <laughs> Please. What is the situation in Bahrain? Do you see the civil society generating, creating new political elite or, you know, the, the leaders? Okay, we have two elements of uh, this issue here. Um, in my opinion, I think we need to get over the classical picture of uh, leaders and leadership. Uh, we are in the 21st century and this might not happen, not in my lifetime. So I believe in, in leading, uh, building a nation, it's um, a matter of a collective work. Each of, within the society, has their own assigned role that will lead to people to, to get up on their feet and build their society and nation. So th th that can be a, a multiple, a collective work. The other element here, which is what's happening uh, in particular in Bahrain and in the region as well, uh, I would uh, rather call them my, my hero fellows there back home because they're not just fighting to stand up against one regime. They're fighting like half of the world. You have the six uh, GCC countries, you have Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and blah, 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 and all the, these people. And on top of that, United Kingdom, add to that United States. All these people, they want you down. And people are determined to stand up and, and build their nations and demand their rights. It's going to work? Yes, it's going to work. But it's hard. Concerning Libya, I have actually the same question, even though uh, the civil society was more successful about bringing people to the important positions. But do you think it's a lasting uh, situation? Is it uh, going to continue this way? Um, ليس لديها شخص واضح أو زعيم أو شخص محدد متفقين عليه لتولي الرئاسة أو يعني المجتمع يرفض قدوم أشخاص أو زعماء تولي الرئاسة يمكن من خلال المظاهرات أو بل يرغبون في قدوم رئيس أو زعيم عن طريق الانتخابات وخاصة نحن للوقت الحالي إلى الوقت الحالي ليس لدينا دستور لدينا برلمان فقط أنا أعتقد أنه بعد إنشاء الدستور أقترح أو أعتقد بعد إنشاء الدستور يمكن أن يتفق المجتمع المدني على شخص لتولي المرحلة القادمة باعتباره زعيم أو رئيس دولة من انتخابات لكن أن مؤسسة المجتمع المدني حاليا متفقة على زعيم أو رئيس لا أعتقد ذلك uh, I don't think the uh, Libyan uh, society is willing to find uh, some leader uh, coming from the civil society uh, by demonstrations or uh, from from the street uh, demonstrations. Uh, I think that uh, people would agree on uh, some personality that comes from uh, from from their vote. And uh, I don't know, maybe from when we have constitution, Megan, we don't have the constitution yet. Uh, we have a parliament, uh, but uh, when we have the constitution done, uh, maybe the people would agree on some personality to come and lead the whole country. Um, uh, but but uh, now we don't have uh, a leader coming from the civil society. Uh, when I was preparing for, for this panel, I found quite an interesting uh, study for, from the Economic Forums, World Economic Forums Global Gender uh, 
uh, gap report which says that actually most of the Middle Eastern countries score more poorly in 2012 than 2011, which means that uh, on the one hand, uh, the Arab Spring initiated uh, women, uh, women political activism, but at the same time, actually, it did not lead to a concrete political gains. Would you agree with that, that actually uh, two and something, two years and something uh, after the revolutions, youth and women are uh, in a more difficult situation than before 2011? Or do you think that there's something wrong with this study and that uh, actually uh, this gap is, uh, is now uh, smaller and that women and, and youth can play a big role uh, in in your uh, countries. So I don't know. Well, this is understandable. It makes sense. Usually, uh, when there is a movement and there is a repression, who is susceptible to repression are the, the weakest and the minorities, and which is understandable that the youth and women are to become mo most likely the casualties of war. But again, this is a transition. It will take some time, and it will get better uh, soon. But um, why we are fighting? So this must end. What, it was better because it's not real. It was a bubble. It was all made up. That's why with, with the first crisis that we came across, it has fallen apart. What we're looking for is something more solid. So. Whatever, whoever comes in, 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 uh, in leadership, whatever uh, authorities that come, cannot break that civil society and cannot affect these groups. That's the, the point, that's the aim, and that what should take some time. And we will be crazy if we think that we're gonna have that next day or next year. It's something that we need to build up over the years, and it might take decades to be able to achieve that. The, the, the state of stability to these groups, to minorities, to women, to children, and extra. Um, women rights and women rule. I want to complain because I'm just one. I'm the minority now. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, it's a change it in the before and after the revolution. Before the revolution, the, the role of women in political parties is not too much. Maybe in the, in the young revolutionary movements or, or uh, young generation is better. You can find leader from girls uh, leading movements or have responsibility in movements, but the old political parties is no. You can, you can, it's uh, very hard to find any leader from women before the revolution in political parties. After the revolution, no, there is many leaders in many political parties from girls and also uh, from movement and also women from uh, in uh, political parties and there is candidates in the elections. Yes, it's not like we want or not like we hope, but it's better than uh, before the revolution. There is many obstacles. The, the old mentality, especially in Upper Egypt, there's, um, it's closed community and uh, the families and they uh, don't want women to be a candidate and, and they will not support women as a parliament member or something like that. But in Cairo and uh, Alexandria and Delta, yes, it's, uh, it's better. You can find candidates from women, you can find leaders from women. Uh, so now it's better. It's not it's not a beautiful life and it's not a real equality, but it's better than before the revolution. And we hope step by step we can make that. I think also, as I mentioned, in Europe also, the women rise to vote. It's, it's not uh, uh, in the beginning. So it takes many years to have real equality between men and women. So in Egypt also, we will take many years to have leaders from women in political parties, in movement, in NGOs, and then I think after five or ten years, we will have uh, maybe president uh, from women. So we will work for that. Um, in relation to the in the and why it was after 2011, in Libya, the woman was a big part of the 
بعد بعد سنة 2011 أو بعد السنة الأولى للثورة لم لم يتراجع بشكل كبير بل كان لها دور بارز كان لها دور بارز في مرحلة التحول الديمقراطي حيث قامت بالعديد من الحملات ووصلت الحملات الحملات النسائية من أجل تخصيص كوتا نسائية في لجنة ستين لصياغة الدستور وكذلك مشاركتها في الحياة السياسية وحاليا المرأة لها وجود داخل السلطة التشريعية المتمثلة في المؤتمر التولي المؤتمر الوطني طبعا نحن المرأة في ليبيا تختلف المرأة في المدن على المرأة في الـ في, الـ في الريف أو المناطق الغير متمدنة المرأة حاليا في ليبيا أنا أعتقد أنها في طور يعني في طور التغيير أو في طور التطور بالرغم من وجود عوائق من قبل الرجال في ليبيا يعني أعتقد ببعض من الرجال لا يريدون المرأة الليبية الوصول إلى أو الدخول في معترك السياسة فيما يتعلق بالأقليات ليبيا أما نحن دين واحد ليس لدينا أقليات لدينا أنا لا أقول لهم أقلياتهم الأمازيغ ونحن على توافق معهم وموجودين داخل الحكومة بمختلف السلطات وموجودين في في مؤسسات المجتمع المدني وكذلك المرأة الأمازيغية موجودة داخل السلطة التشريعية وموجودة في مؤسسات المجتمع المدني. Um, uh, in the beginning, I would say that uh, the difference between uh, uh, 11 years, 11 and 12, uh, there is uh, not that much uh, what to say in uh, Libya because uh, the uh, the women always took part in uh, the political uh, life in Libya, and uh, now they are taking part uh, in uh, the political life. Uh, they are in the parliament. Uh, they are uh, taking decisions uh, in the committees. Uh, so um, this is uh, no big difference between what be between the past and now. Uh, about uh, the minorities, uh, well, we don't have uh, this uh, specificism in uh, Libya because uh, uh, we are all uh, from one nation. Uh, they are uh, the people who belong to Amazigh. Uh, they are people, the original people of uh, this country, uh, but we are of the same uh, religion, so uh, there is uh, uh, nothing uh, that uh, we don't agree on, and then they are also taking part in the uh, political uh, political decisions. Okay, I will ask you about this question as well. What's your experience, uh, you know, dealing with men and women in the civil society? Are you accepted by them differently if it's a woman or if it's a man? Because my, and this is a little bit off the topic, but my, my experience when I was as an NGO worker in Pakistan was quite hard, you know, dealing with men. Uh, so it was much easier to, to deal with women. But in, at, the, at the same time, the problem was that they often didn't have the power to implement the decisions. So do you have any similar uh, experience from Egypt and, and Libya? Well, first of all, for me as a, as, a, as a woman, it's not just about being a woman, but also age, it's, it's, it's a bit of an issue because um, Egypt especially, and, and Libya, the, the, the hierarchy of society, and also this was a, uh, the, the, the great win of the, 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 the protest and the revolution of the 25th of January, where the youth uh, went to the fore and uh, then many different sides took, took it as a, uh, as a way to to um, to gain the support and the votes and the um, the youth on their side, because this was quite unexpected in 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 these countries where uh, a lot of the politicians are of sixties um, uh, and and uh, and around this fifties or sixties around the age. So um, and and this I think to an extent the same goes to 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 Libya. Um, so that I think is also a, a very important factor and. Um, in in what uh, how how civil society activists and in in my case it's different I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a foreigner and I uh, um, so I think it's more who who I represent rather than who who I am which is which is relevant but in 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 the sense of and I don't know what what Ahmed you have your own experience and the others 
um, but I uh, sometimes sensed a sort of um, disrespect for the young people who are, yes, they are active, yes, they were out there, but actually they don't know much. And so we should, we don't really have to listen to them. And whether it's, this is a woman or a man, um, and I think this is more of the, more of an issue that I would, I would focus on. Um, but as for, um, uh, in Egypt, I have seen a lot of women, um, very, very strong uh, in uh, heading civil society organizations and campaigns. And I would, I would dare say they're even, they're, they're sometimes even scary. <laughs> no, it's, uh, I, I really think that uh, um, they are playing a role. Um, with now, this is a different thing when we talk about women who, who are not uh, activists or who had not been activists before. Um, and the kind of going back to normal life, which for many people mean um, going back to their homes and working in, uh, or not working or working, it's, um, I think this, this level of women um, is, it's a slightly different, uh, different story. And I think Fatma was referring to the, to the active, um, uh, to the ones that, you know, you had um, the, the spokesperson of the NTC in the first days of the revolution, you had women in, 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 in Sabha, in the very south of Libya, uh, uniting and, and, uh, um, and organizing the whole distribution of aid, in, which, is, which is not, with no experience in civil society, you can claim this is quite something, and I don't know how many of us we would be able to do. Uh, and the same in Benghazi, this was quite, uh, um, and, and these women, they somehow, they retained the, that, that position, but uh, yes, talking about women in general, I think, uh, uh, you know, with that bubble bursting and going back into normal life, uh, I think that, that plays a role. Okay, I have so many questions on my paper, but uh, I, I also promise to give space to the audience, but before that, uh, Ahmed wants to say something because he's the minority, we have to yeah, give him yeah, this, I'm, this right. <laughs> I'm lucky man here. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, just to, want to add something. I forget about the uh, uh, risk in Egypt for women. Uh, sometimes uh, before the revolution and during and after and now, of course, it's a uh, risk to, for women to deal with politics. Maybe in NGOs or civil society, it's okay, but in politics, demonstrations, clashes, arresting, sometimes you can find family prevent the girl from going or participate in meeting or conference or you are joining opposition, be careful, or don't join opposition, or don't join political parties, because they afraid and they care about her or something like that. So, because it's not safe sometimes uh, during this uh, transition period or during revolution, so it's uh, make the families try to prevent or ban the girls from participating in politics. Thank you. So, uh, I see the first question over there. Just please shortly introduce yourself. So, Ali, the Sayyid Aklara. How have you learned something new that you can add to the work of the community organizations through the work in Libya? We will have the translation. Oh, we will have two translations actually. So, we will compare later. This question was for Clara Bednarchova. Did you learn something new? Uh, that uh, uh, you can add for the nature of work of the civil society uh, during your uh, work in Libya. If you uh, like, can uh, give them advice for what uh, you can, what kind of advices you can give them, <coughs> if I understand it. Thank okay, you. Is there any other questions so we can collect more than one? Yes, gentlemen here in the in the front. Uh, you can shout, but we will give you the microphone, so you don't have to. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Michal. I study here in Prague, and I want to ask about these official civil society institutions that Nada briefly mentioned. And uh, negatively, I want to ask whether you know institutions such as Qatar Foundation, the most famous one can't be like infiltrated and used for some positive change, especially on, for example, female issues, because, you know, like and gender equality, because Qatar Foundation is, is led by, by Sheikha Al Thani, so is led by a woman, so couldn't there be some progress on, you know, like, I don't know, women training and more participation in politics and so on? Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, and the last one for the first round, and then will be second round. So, yeah. I have actually, I'm from the Austrian Embassy. My name is Margaret Trautmannsdorf, and I have actually no questions, just a comment. I lived in Egypt at Mo during Mubarak's time almost for five years. I, I was very involved with Egyptian society at the time, and I must contradict what you said that women played no role in politics. It's not true. You have, I was actually prejudged, pre uh, I had prejudice before I went, thinking that actually women in Egypt were not allowed to f go out of their homes and would stay home and look for after their family. But in fact, I found exactly the contrary. I found fantastic women being doctors, professors, politicians, parliamentarians, including um, NGO leaders, and um, maybe they were not in line with today's politics, certainly not, of course not, and controlled, but they were there, and women in Egypt have been always strong. But of course, in certain society levels, very low classes, people were afraid, the girls' issue is a big issue, the health issue of girls. Uh, you want to make sure they can get married, and they only can get married if they have not been in touch too much with men and in open public. But um, in that way, I just want to say that I see this very differently. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment, and we will leave, uh, let Ahmed to, to react la later. But let's start with, with uh, Clara and her experience from Libya. Um, thank you, thank you, Basit, for that for that question. I take it as a sign of trust. <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't say advice. I would maybe um, like to point out some of the the, the positive. Uh, I don't want to make it sound bad. Positive surprises and the strengths I've seen in in Libya, where civil society really could do and change something, um, and uh, where I was. What I see is very, very positive in, in Libya. Um, one of the um, uh, one of, one of the, the things is um, is simply expertise. Um, and I mentioned the, the, the human rights uh, organizations, the lawyers, people who who know the situation from the onset, and they are very clear about what they want to change, and and how that change needs to happen. Um, and it's about commenting the because we are. Libya is in a state is in a state building stage actually, and and uh, um, so there I think the pressure on civil society is even bigger. And I was saying it's a stepping stone towards politics. I mean, it's everybody has to somehow who can form part of that that effort. And I think that um, the the more focused and the more uh, uh, basically the more focused organizations or activists are able to. Um, are able to really uh, bring the results faster. And I've started noticing a sort of um, um, uh, looking down upon uh, civil society organizations by whether it's some journalists or, or people in general, uh, thinking that they only go to trainings and they only, they only attend, they only talk about civil society, but where are the results? Um, so I think maybe this is a call for civil society to really, to really move faster in their focus and, and, and uh, um, although I do understand it's very hard. Another thing is um, the, uh, the, the closeness of civil society towards the people and the, the fact that um, you, can, you, can have, uh, you can have exchanges and, and, and Fatma can talk about this. Um, and in going to Sirt, places where, where um, uh, basically the, the the revolution was not, as uh, to say the least, welcomed um, to uh, where we wouldn't even expect civil society to be, and definitely not on the side of the new new political powers. And the ability of these groups to to co connect and to talk to each other, while the the heads of whether it's a militia or a tribe will never talk to each other, or it will be very hard. And this is something, uh, and uh, you, you call it transitional justice. Um, I, I would say really people to people uh, to communicate, to kind of bridge and, and uh, yes, it's part of transitional justice and I think this is where civil society's role is, uh, is 
uh, potentially very important. So I would, I would focus on, on, on this, I think, at the outset. So. Thank you. Regarding the government and non-governmental organizations, the gongos, as we call them, uh, back home, uh, these are the bodies, the foundations that are made by the government, completely funded by the government, and actually licensed and authorized to be uh, to work on the ground. On the contrary, you see, like our situation, we, we've existed for two years, and we're not allowed to to work uh, or to be authorized or get license. Uh, to work within our country, and that's why we had to open our offices out, out there in Europe. Uh, but uh, the, the smart thing about creating the gongos, actually, uh, they make a crowd, they make a, a, a noise. So even if you want to raise up your voice and to be heard, there will be always a background and echo and blah, blah, blah. There's always like another voice. And it, it sometimes it makes it very difficult to international NGOs to, to recognize who's who and who's telling the truth. But uh, the other smart thing that they're really not doing uh, they're infiltrating these uh, gongos and they're putting the, the, their people when it comes, it's very obvious, uh, these, these bodies, these uh, uh, forums, or especially in the women's issues, uh, they're led by the king's wife or daughters. Or uh, Usually you'll find the women of the ruling uh, families are in, in board of uh, these places. But it's quite difficult to distinguish when it comes to other uh, gongos that's dealing with human rights or freedoms, freedoms of expression and association and that, that, that part. But um, being uh, part of the um, uh, UN, and I've been dealing with the UN mechanism for the past two years, uh, I can tell you, like uh, specifically in the United Nations, they are really doing uh, a hard job and going extra mile to find the real NGOs from who's not. Uh, other places in the world, uh, are they buying it or not? I'm not sure. But really, I'll tell you, sometimes it gets really difficult to distinguish and tell. Um. أريد أن نقول بعد الثورة نحن في ليبيا أصبح لدينا حرية تعبير أو أهم شيء بعد الثورة تغير بعد الثورة هي حرية التعبير في ليبيا لكل شخص له الحق في قول في قول أي شيء الصحافة حرية التعبير والإعلام حرية كذلك له حرية الحرية في إنشاء مؤسسات المجتمع المدني لكن نحن كليبيون نشعر بالإحباط بسبب تعامل المجتمع الدولي مع الحالة الليبية نحن لا ننكر في البداية أنه قدم يد العون لنا في المجتمع الدولي ولكننا نطمح لأكثر من ذلك في ليبيا نحن really practicing our freedom of speech. I think on the level of, uh, of uh, the people, of each one of us, on the level of uh, civil society uh, as a whole, uh, this is something we can't deny. But uh, on the other hand, I think that uh, the civil society is uh, uh, still looking forward to, uh, to be more effective, uh, to have uh, more to say, to, uh, uh, to the politi political life and uh, to bring uh, the society to a better level of life. Ahmed, do you want to add something? Yes, uh, it's uh, just misunderstanding what I say. I didn't say there is uh, no women in politics uh, before the revolution. No, there's many brave women in, in politics. But uh, I said, Yes, many brave women in politics, many brave women in NGOs during Mubarak time. But I mentioned, or I mean that in traditional politics, in candidates, in the parliament, in the list of political parties, before the revolution, you can just find two, three from NDB as a decor, not really candidates. After the revolution, also, you can find in, in each list of political parties in the parliament elections in 2011, um, one or two women, uh, or some, some, sometimes you can find parties neglect uh, women because they, in Upper Egypt, he said, 
no, the, uh, the people will not vote for women. So please, we just want list of men. That's happened already in 2011. So I, I, I just talk about the, the political parties and list. But rural women, yes, it's, uh, many women have big role before the revolution and led the revolution. And also in Tahrir Square during the revolution, we saw what happened from women. I, I know that. So it's just misunderstanding. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that even though I promise you the second round of questions, I think we have to finish because the, uh, the, another panel will be here. But uh, before you leave, I really would like to thank the panelists and especially our guests from, uh, from the region because whereas most of us will go home safely, you have to go back to the countries which are far, far away from being safe. So I, we really appreciate what you are doing. Uh, great admiration and please big applause to our guests, thank you very much.